chapter 10. 09-03 hours. 193-776-M41. Fifth compartment. Sparsh Mons. Arshion 60s. Twice in half an hour, they had pushed the enemy back from the top of the hill. Support weapons and well-disciplined rifle drill had done most of that work. But in places that had been brutal, Clyde responded to casualties from a face-to-face -face scrap where blood-packed troops had come up along a blind defile and flanked his second section. While the sense they had reached the tipping point in this particular scrap, was the enemy going to break, or was it going to force a third attempt at the sloops? It was hard to tell. Daylight had come heavy and white, but the visibility was cut drastically by the waves of smoking running off the hill crest. Reports said his own line was still in position, but where the enemy stood was a matter of guesswork. Waldo was finding it difficult to see anyway, because of the blood in his eyes. He'd been halfway along the encampment when a nearby Herberican Chimera had taken a rocket. The vehicle had gone up like a demol demolition mine, and Welder had been flung forward by the blast, gashing his forehead against the bowl of a dead, splintered tree. Now he had to keep blinking away the drops dabbling on his head. He could taste the salt in his mouth. He reached the position commanded by one of the Tenth Company officers, a Captain Durmore, and his own Captain Kodasim. Throne. He had to stop thinking like that. They are both his own now. Are you all right, sir? Durmore asked as Wilder scrambled up. Durmore was a solid four-square man with a reliable air about him. His eyes had been repaired at some point in his career by heavy augmented implants. The Tenneth had a nickname for him, but Wilder couldn't remember it. I'm fine, he replied. What have we got? They pulled back to the stream down there, replied Corsum. A burly redhead. Lots of cover sweeping that way. Lots of rocks. We've got a line of sight overlap with Sergeant Birkin's troop but neither of us can determine what they're doing. I pushed two units down the flank, Doma said. Rilligans and Theseus, in case they suddenly stab that way across the ditch. Far away to the left, the meaty chatter of the auto cannon throbbed the air. Think they're coming back for another go, sir? Coulson asked. How stupid do they look, Ferdy? Well, they grinned. Stupid enough we could be here all day, replied Colson. What about those tankers, sir? said Sergeant Bannard. Feared Colson's urgent. Coward bastards. We've all got our own words for the tank boys, Bernard, Wilder said. And I'll be having most of them with that leapier brain suck pig gathered on at the moment. I'd find him, if I find him. Walder held up his hand suddenly. What was that? A low note, a machine noise, had just reached them. That's armor. One of the Belladon troopers said with some confidence. Some of the men crawled forward to try and spot enemy vehicles in the smoke. It's behind us said Colson. No, that's just the echo roll backwash, Bernard said. Captain Doma had turned and was gazing up into the smoke bank pluming off the hill behind them. Colson's right, he said. What? Walder said. Oh, Feth, Doma said suddenly and grabbed the vice horn from the Vox officer. Inbound, inbound, report your position. Inbound, I say again, report your position. If you're on approach, be advised we have troopers on the grid. Inbound, at uh, two minutes, a hot for strike on grid target. To Wild's eyes, the smoke was just smoke. 
but Domo's augmentics, enhanced beyond human vision, had picked up the heat trails chopping in at low level. He glanced at Walder. Order retreat, right now, Walder said. Domo started yelling into the Vox. Up and back, now, Walder yelled. Double time, get off this hill. Grabbing kit and weapons, the men started to scramble back down the slope, running between burning shells of Hurricane machines. All along the saddle of the hill, the troopers of the 81st First began a frantic pull back towards the trackway. About a minute later, with the men still running, the gunship slammed out of the smoke. The roar of the turbojets preceded them like a bow wave of a ship. Twenty-five vulture attack ships boom-tailed, jut-jawed and painted in cream and tan dapple, burned in through the smoke bank at treetop altitude. The vague shadow slid over Wilder's men in the haze sunlight. He heard the hiss-whoosh as the underwing rocket pods began to fire. Spears of vapor shot out ahead of the thundering vultures, and top of the hill disappeared in a necklace of fireballs that quivered the ground. While they saw men on the slopes knocked down by a shockwave. They're coming in short, he yelled at the nearest voxman. Tell them they're coming in short. The man started shouting into his link. The second wave drummed over, rippling the hanging smoke with the powerful backwash. Another salvo of fragmentation rockets squealed out over the hill. Another riot of fire and... Hurled soil chewed up the land. S- I've got strike, come on. Control, the Vox officer reported. I think I've persuaded them to redirect beyond the hill. A third wave came in. Or maybe it was the first on its reprise. Well, they couldn't tell. The third rocket strike went in behind the hill, detonating down the far slope. The thick black smoke from the first strike eddied in the wild patterns the vultures traveled through it. Wilder clapped the Vox man on the shoulder. Nice piece of fast talk, my friend. What's your name? The man looked at him in surprise. Efston, sir. It's Efston. It was Eveston. Belladon born and raised. Vox men in Vesquitis troop. Wilder had become so overcautious about correctly identifying his new mix, he failed to recognize a man he'd known for years. Ifson's face was smeared with soot, but there was no excuse. Of course it is, Walder said. I was just testing. He added, trying to joke it off. Ifston just laughed and scooped up his voxcaster to head for the nearest ditch. It was indeed a laughing matter, but Walder hadn't felt much like laughing all day. Hey, Ifston, Walder called. Did strike control explain the grid error to you? Esther nodded. They said it wasn't an error. They were locked on the plot the Hibernican had given them. They got the signal to require about half an hour later and moved back down the trackway road, post 36, four kilometers back down the encampment. It was mid-morning by the time the 81st first began to resemble. Post 36 was one of the field HQs set up in the friendly end of the fifth compartment. It lay close to the west wall and within sight of the gargantuan gateway leading into the fourth compartment. The post covered about two square kilometers, most of which was taken up with soapy drums and field tents. Some of the post facilities, including the field hospital, had been set up in the crumbling house of Imperials that had found as they pushed into the fifth. The house was a single-story stone structure as old and ragged as the Mons walls themselves. Ruins like it could be found throughout the explored compartments of the Step City. Some just wall plans proud of the dirt, others still upright and flanking. No two were alike and no purpose for them had yet been decided. There was some talk that they were the remains of primitive domiciles, that the compartments had once been filled with populated cities. Others of the houses were shanty relics built by local tribes who had come to scrape a living and dwell inside the walls long after the Mons itself had become a ruin. 
A third theory ran that the compartments had always been open areas of contained wilderness constructed within some mystical purpose, and the houses were the temples and shrines left behind the, by the original builders of the Mons. Waller didn't much care. The place made a decent enough foothold camp from which the exploration and clearance of the compartment could be run. Several regiments of infantry were gathered at post 36. On the high road up to the great gate, others could be seen moving in. An armor column, supply vehicles, Valkyrie dropships were swinging down into a wide table rock of basalt, west of the post dropping off wounded from the field. Some of those bodies on the stretchers were wild as men. Once they dropped, the Valkyries either lifted off and headed back out into their compartments for a second run, or flew on south through the massive arch of the gate, heading to the landing fields of the fourth compartment, forward positions. Walder walked off the roadway track and up the dusty slope into the post. Sunlight was burning off the grasses and the islands of scrub behind him. In the far wall, the compartment rose like a desert cliff. He looked up as flight of cream and tan vultures went over, heading home. There was a bunch of armored vehicles parked by the roadside, most of them back drab, numbers from a regiment Walder didn't recognize. But amongst them were at least five Haberican trades, and other Haberican units were grumbling up the winding track out of the valley floor. Get the men rested and watered, he told Basquiat. Ration detail and weapon check by 1400. I want every one with the full load. No excuses. Yes, sir. Walder headed up the dirt causeway to the hospital. Militorum pioneers had roofed the house with precast armor ply sheeting and reinforced the walls with flakboard and sandbags. The north end consisted of the post command station in the area. It extended from the building with tent canopies. A pair of vox masts had been set up nearby, trailing cables off into the bank of the generators behind the building. The rest of the place was given over to the triad station and infirmary. There was a pervading smell of sawdust and new chip panel that almost choked out the regular odors of a field hospital. Neither the severely wounded nor the dead stayed there long. There was no facility for them. Regular transport runs ferried them away to main station compounds at Flag Flats and Therino, or to the gradually swelling cemetery out in the desert. Post-36 hospital was proceeding point. Superficial and efficient, treating minor wounds, illnesses, and infection, and patching less fortunate up for evac. The less fortunate, while they thought about, where were they? Where they really... He walked in under the low arch, stepping inside to let the procession of stretcher bearers inside. To the right lay a pair of rooms given over to triage, with an adjoining chamber fitted up as a field theater. There were two more theaters and habitants outside in the causeway. To the left, there were three small wards, where men with minor wounds could be given bed rest and treatment for a few days before returning to active duties, and grossly injured would wait for transport. The place was busy, to say the least. It hadn't stopped being busy since the guard had moved in and occupied the position five days earlier. Walder saw a few of his men amongst the injured, most of them walking wounded with cuts and burns. He exchanged encouraging words with a few. So far, there were about five more seriously hurt. Two unconscious, one of them Sergeant Peven, who Wilder had always had a lot of time for, Paven looked like he'd been smacked in the face with a flat iron. The other trooper, Buritz, had been shot eight or nine times. Lumps on his torso and legs were missing. Two corpsmen were busy in bedding him. 
Further down, Wilder found Trooper Reidy, or Cot. The Belladin was woozing in and out of consciousness, high on painkillers. His foot and ankle had been crushed by a stalker. Big bastard it was, sir, Reidy said. You got it? Wilder asked. No, mate, no, sir. But it was got. Wilder smiled. Reddy's injury could be a long time healing. He would soon be one of his less fortunate. Did McCard make it out, sir? Reddy called out. Sorry? McCard, sir. He was with me when it happened. I hope he made it out, sir. Reddy said. I will find out, Wilder said. Reddy had expressed genuine concern. If for one of the influx, McCard was a tenth name. Maybe that alloy was strong already. Nearby, Wilder spotted the elderly chief, Medike, who had joined with the tenth. He was strapping up a vigorous warm wound. Doctor? Dorden looked around. One moment, Colonel, he said, finishing up Dorden. Seemed fragile and brittle to Wilder. Too old for battlefield duty, but he had the seniority and the skill, and since the Beradun had lost most of its Medike staff, that counted for a lot. This way, Colonel, Dorden said. He led Wilder over to a vacant dressing table. Just tilt your head back, please. What? Oh! Wilder had almost forgotten his own injury. I'm not here for that, Doctor. I just stopped in to get some idea of numbers. We had to pull out of the line in a hurry, and I have no idea what kind of hit we took. Doran shrugged. I'm sorry, Colonel. I can't really answer that. They're still coming in, as you can see. And I've not been keeping a tally of bandages. Just bodies to patch. Nikolstek, 50th Toka, hammering early this morning along the bluff. We've been airlifting them in for the past hour. Bad hammering. Is there a good kind? What about you? Fairly intense. Uh, a mess, actually. I'll go talk with the men. I'd prefer to treat that wound right now, actually. Jordan said. Later. Get to someone who needs you more urgently. Jordan looked at him for a moment, then turned away. Wilder was about to cross over into the wards when he saw that the door at the back of the house was open. In the patch of sunlight outside, body bags lay on the dry earth. He went out, removing his cap despite the glare. Nearly forty bodies lay in neat lines. Drill ground perfection. Orderlies were carrying more over from nearby trucks. Wilder walked down the line, looking at the tags tied off the round at the bag seals. He found two Belladin and Teneth, McCart. An ancient, hunched man was slowly moving down the rows, reading from a hymnal and blessing each body in turn. Their last rites. Field style. Antony. Wilder nodded. Ziri peered at him. The old priest always struck Wilder as a little mad, but he was just another part of the influx. Colonel, another day in the dust unto which we will all return. Most of us fester than we are at this state. Wilder wasn't quite sure what to say. The old man had a knack of blindsiding him. Some days, you know, I praise the beloved beauty for some skill that I can contribute. I don't fight, as you know, and I don't fix. Not like doctrine. I often pray to her for her generous ability to bring them back from the dead. Um, who, father? Zir gestured at the bodies on the ground. Them? Others? Anyone? But so far, she's refused to grant me that knack. Can you do it, Wilder? What? 
bring them back from the dead. N no, father. It's funny, sometimes you look, look to me exactly the sort of person who can bring them back from the dead. Sorry. No. I like to think my area's skill lay in not getting them killed in the first place. And even that's not infallible. Zwell sniffed and wiped his nose on his sleeve. None of us are perfect. He stared up at Wilder, and the wild surprise grabbed a hold of Wilder's jaw with his less than clean fingers. You should get that look, that's... Zwei said, twisting Wilder's face around so he could scrutinize the head wound. Yes, I will. Thanks, Father, Wilder said, praying the priest's hands away. Dorda and off to the patch it up, but I said he could wait. Why? Three-edged father. Exactly. What? Zai took a dried fig from his pocket and sucked it thoughtfully. Dryad's degree's a priority. Only a scrape. But you are the company commander. What if you leave it and it gets infected? That's the regiment. At this early, delicate stage without a chief. I, I suppose so, father. So get it done. Priorities. Yes, father. Before the whole mob of them starts flailing around for the want of proper leadership, with you in bed feverish with blood poisoning. Yes, father. And gangrene of the eyebrows and black pus oozing from... Thank you, father. I'll go right away. That's my other skill. Vi called out as Wilder turned away. I just remembered it's to give sage advice and good counsel. I bless the beauty for granting me that talent. Yes, father. Are you sure? Zai called out as Wilder reached the door into the house. Wilder looked back. About what? Zwei was staring down at the bagged bodies on the dry earth. He was subdued again now. His sudden mood swings and skipping trains of thoughts had a bipolar quality to them. You can't bring them back. No, Antony, father. I can't. Zwei sighed. Carry on, then. Lose the headset and the hat, Dorden said. Wilder obliged. Head back. Dorden washed the wound and pulled it shut with some plastic staples. I'd dress it, but it'd be better to get the air into it, Dorden said. He handed Wilder a small tube of counterseptic gel. Put this on every few hours, keep it clean, come back in a day or two. Thanks, Wilder said. Maskiv appeared in the triage bay doorway and cited Wilder. Debray wants to feel the brief, sir. I don't think he's too taken with the mess this morning. He can join the queue behind me. Walder said. What does he want me? When does he want me? At your most convenience. I told him you were being patched. Walder nodded. We got a tally yet. Eight dead, Maskell said. Thirty-eight wounded, twelve of those serious, and not two so far. Could have been a whole lot worse, Walder said. A whole hell of a lot worse. Passing my clubbermints to Captain Domar, by the way. He's the one with the reason if it wasn't. Mm, sir? And we'll get the company leaders together and... Uh... Waldo was tucking the counterceptic tube onto his coat pocket. And his hand had just encountered the forgotten message wafer. He pulled it out and read it. Sir, something's the matter... Basquiat asked. What? There's a look on your face like... Like I don't know what. 
Wanda looked up at his first officer and was about to reply when Dorden interrupted. He was holding Wilder's microbead headset and cap. Your link is squawking, he said. Wilder pulled the headset in place, in time to hear a repeated call. Wilder receiving. Go ahead. This is our colonel. Please come down to the personal area. Hark saluted as Wilder and Baskir approached. The wide dirt pan of the dispersal area was filling up with vehicles. Treads were turning from the front, an inbound convoy from the gate. Hark was standing beside a trio of dirty chimeras supporting Haberkin livery. This way, Hark said. A crowd of Haberkin troopers had gathered around the rear of one of the AFVs. Wilder felt his fist tighten. Stand aside, Hark snarled, and the tanker crews broke to let them through. Gavin, an Haberkin's commander, was cuffled by one wrist to tie a bar on the commander's rear end. He was a shallow-faced man with thin yellow hair. His tunic had half-moons of perspiration under the arms. Release me, he snapped at Hark. This is ridiculous. Ridiculous, Waldo said. Gavin saw him for the first time and stiffened. You are supposed to advance, Gavin, Waldo said. The zone was mined. Not so much. You had to stop dead and cut engines. I warned you what would happen. I listened to you, Gavadon protested. When the assault came, I took immediate action. You reversed to regain trackway. Though my men who had moved in to support you, you nearly ran them down and left them stranded. Line broken. Then you called down an airstrike. The situation was extremely dangerous. We might have been overrun. It was essential that it was dangerous, all right. You'd seen that. My men were still in target grid, fighting your fight for you. When the vultures came in, didn't you think... Didn't you care? I thought you'd pulled back, too. Why? Because you did. We're not all gutless worms, Gavin. Gavdion didn't answer. He was standing over Wilder's shoulder. Marshal Debray was approaching, led by Major Gordigan, Gavdion's second in command. The man drew back further, respectfully. Debray entered the circle of tank troopers, a slightly built man with white hair and a permanently listless expression on his lined face. Debray looked them up and down. Stand down, Colonel Wilder, he said. This isn't your place to direct reprimand. Do you cuff this man, Kamelzar? Hawk nodded. Debray stared at Gavron. I've been reading through the preliminaries, Gavron. Not a pretty picture. In the first place, you should have pushed on. In the second, you should have held tight, like Waldo told you. Third, the airstrike was fantastically a bad call. The situation was critical, sir, Gavin said. There were mines and, funny that, mines. It'd be in a war. You're an asshole, Gavin. But you and your entire unit is new to this theater and fresh-founded. You're off to a famously bad start. But I hope you can learn from this and get your bloody act together. Quickly. Be bold. Be decisive. Stick to the plan. And when an experienced officer like Wilder gives you advice, bloody follow it. Are we clear? Sir. Being cuffed up, humiliated, and called an arsehole by me in front of your men is probably punishment enough. Uncuff him. Please, Kamazar. Hawk paused. Then stepped forward and released Gavin's restraint. Are you sure? Just going to let him... Wilder began. Up, up, up. 
de Bray said, raising a hand. I appreciate your rancor, Wilder, but I did tell you this wasn't your place, direct reprimand. Actually, Marshal, it's not yours either, said Hawk bluntly. This man was found wanting in the service of the God Emperor today. Sorely wanting. He turned a small auto pistol and appeared in his hand. The single shot made everyone around start. Gavinon slammed back against the rear of the chimera, a fern leaf of blood from the back of his head decorating the plating. He fell on his face. The Herberkin men all around gazed in speechless horror. Debray glared at Hawk. Discipline and punishment are the provinces of the Commissariat, Hawk said clearly, so all could hear. We do not need to hear another word from you on the matter, Marshal. The Herberkin crews will learn from this demonstration that the Imperial Guard, War Master Makaroth, and the Emperor himself will not tolerate incompetence or cowardice, especially from line officers. Major Gerrigan, I hope this is an ample inspiration to you to be a much better regimental leader than you are a presiducer. Clean this up and clean up your act. He holstered his pistol and walked away. The Bray sniffled, glanced humorously at Walda, then stalked back to his command station. That report, please, Wilder, he called over his shoulder. Wilder caught up with Hawk halfway to the 81st first billet. What now? Hawk said. Nothing, I, I just... Wilder shrugged. Men desert in the field and you let them run, but you're quite happy to execute a ranking officer. Yes? Let it be a lesson to you, Hawk said. He stopped walking and turned to face Walder. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. I like to think that this might be illuminated you a little as to my approach. Men desert in the field. They're afraid. Why are they afraid? Because they're not being led soundly. Should they be executed for a simple human feeling? No. I don't believe so. I think they should be given a solid leader so it doesn't happen again. An officer fails when the whole structure fails down. Gavin was why those men were running. Gavin was a failure. So I reserved my sincere for him. Walder nodded. Are we good? asked Hawk. Yes. Hawk began walking again. Hawk. What, Colonel? Walder had a message with her. I received this earlier. I think maybe you should see it. Hark read the note. Is this confirmed, sir? Yes. Holy throne, they're alive. After all, we... Well, that's unexpected. Have you told anyone? No. You're the first. Hark nodded. We better decide how to handle this. How do we tell the ghosts that gaunts are still alive? All right, that's going to be another short one done for today. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. It's a lot of fun reading these stories. And thank you all for chugging along with me through all the stuff that's going on. I, it's <sighs> Four in the morning that I'm recording this. <sighs> oh. Finished editing around that this time, honestly. I always do the ending after I'm done editing so I could just wrap it up and I got to hear it like three to four times. <sighs> More new characters to remember the voices for. Not even halfway done with his last command. And if there are any more God's ghost novels you want me to read, let me know. Kaifus Kane is up next. 
Uh, you guys are... Everyone's expecting this one the most, so... I'm not going to let you wait another week for another Kaifas Kane story. We're going to have another few more stories come out. Another one for Kaifas Kane is going to be showing up on Wednesday. And another one for Saturday, which is going to be a two-parter. Uh, yeah. I'm going to keep my word on that because it's been a week, almost two weeks, I think, with no Kaifas Kane and... Yeah. Also, when I start the third, or fourth book, actually, the Choose Your Enemies book, mm, let's just say the little tune that plays in the beginning, I have a certain group of friends that are going to be reworking it with me, and um, we're going to release a whole entire song, if we can, about Kaifas Kane. Yeah. And it's going to be a new tune to play in the beginning. Think of it as Kaifas Kane's theme song. Anyways, if you want to support the channel, you can always be a Patreon supporter. I'm all I ask is a dollar. I'm not asking for much. And if you want to add more to that, you can go up to five, ten, you know, you know, drill anything else. It's monthly, once a month, the first day of the month, whatever. I post full blooper reels on there once they're fully completed. I actually have about five minutes worth of bloopers already. That's going to be going up on the channel sometime soon. You get a little bit of it at the end of some of these videos. So that's that. And, um... If you like the video, leave a like. If you want to see more videos just like it, subscribe, hit the bell. You know, the other the jazz that all YouTubers have to say. <laughs> Leave a comment down below if you want to talk about anything, honestly. Uh, if you play Minecraft, mm, what's your most recent build? If you play Genshin Impact, who is your favorite character and why? I'm not talking about character, uh, like, like, the kid ones. I'm talking about, like, for gameplay-wise. Because I am a fan of that. I like the game, I like it's venturing. I might actually want to try and stream that one day soon. I don't know how to exactly do that, but I will figure it out. Maybe Twitch or something. I'd rather stream on YouTube, but... Oh well. <laughs> and thank you, Mr. Costman123, for the monthly subscription. Anyways. I've been me. Then you've been you. And thank you for watching another one of my videos. I hope you have a good one. Bye-bye. <laughs>